and the United Nations to eliminate violence against women and girls and committing to gender equality and women's empowerment. Violence against women and girls is a human rights violation, but also not compatible with our cultural values and faith. This is evident in the National Inquiry into Family Violence Report just launched last year that was led by the Samoa Office of the Ombudsman, which is also the human rights institution. Some of the statistics show that almost one up to five women are raped in their lifetime. The majority of women, that is six out of 10, experience intimate partner violence in their lifetime. And nine of, out of 10 children experience violence in their lifetime. But Samoa is no exception to this problem. This is a problem across the Pacific and the world. The Pacific Sustainable Development Report that was also launched last year by PIFS highlighted the high prevalence rates of violence in the Pacific with more than 60% in Melanesian and more than 40% in Polynesian Micronesian. This spotlight initiative will hopefully address root causes of gender-based violence and, the amble, and be able to target support based on evidence and cultural context. On that note, like in any gathering here in Samoa and across the Pacific, we will begin this event with a word of prayer. May I now invite Reverend James Bakwan, General Secretary for Pacific Conference of Churches, to please open our event with a word of prayer. Honorable Prime Minister, Pacific Island leaders, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I acknowledge that we are gathered here representing not only a wide diversity of nations and cultures, but also faiths. And as I lead us in an invocation in the Christian tradition, I invite you all to use this moment as a spiritual pause, a moment to center yourselves for the important issue we are about to discuss. The psalmist writes in Psalm 46 verse 1, God is our shelter and refuge, a help in the times of trouble. Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew says, set your mind on God's kingdom and his justice before everything else, and the rest will come to you as well. And the prophet Micah urged us to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. The following prayer is adapted from the Ecumenical Women's Network's Break the Silence Liturgy. Let us pray. God, who gathers us under the protection of your wings, protect us from all that would seek to harm us, our families, our communities, our region, and our planet. May we rest in the knowledge that your justice will prevail and that through the resurrection of Jesus you said no to violence of the cross and affirmed that violence would not have the last word. We pray particularly for all women and girls who suffer violence in the home and elsewhere, for children who witness it, for the abuser whose self-centeredness and selfishness knows no restraint, and for the wider family torn apart by it. May your compassion surround the abused and your judgment the abuser. We also pray for those who live behind bars incarcerated, women and men forgotten and dehumanized, for those living behind prison walls we no longer see, for women and men shackled to grinding poverty who lack the basic necessities we take for granted, those who are homeless, jobless, those struggling with addiction or mental illness. We pray for courageous women and men who speak to the world of so much pain, who refuse to make peace with or give in to despair or cynicism, who reach out and meet the world's deep need, who continue to dream and vision and struggle for a more just world. We pray for our Pacific communities. May we truly be a region of freedom and justice for all, a region of peace, regardless of politics, ethnicity, color, gender, sexual orientation or creed. May we stand united in the diversity in which we were formed and may we work together for the sake of all. We pray for all known to us who suffer with illness, sickness or pain. Return them to the wholeness 
and remember those who care for them. We especially lift up the women and men known to us, and may your healing spirit comfort and strengthen each one. Divine breath of life, you gave us this earth to be our home. Bring an end to selfish desires that ravage the air, land, and water. Help us to see all creation as important and precious for the survival of our planet. Redeemer of all, help us to turn empty religious ritual into Christ's transforming and healing power. May we do our part in bringing restoration. May we be the people who know your love so abundantly that we share it in service of others. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, with Jesus as our example, help us to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with you, O God, our hope and our salvation. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Bakwan, for the uplifting prayer and message and inviting the Spirit to be with us during this special event. Without further ado, it now gives me the pleasure to invite our first speaker, the Honorable Prime Minister of Samoa, to Laepa Sailele Malielengawai for his official welcoming remarks. Reverend James Bagwan, Honorable President and Prime Ministers, Cabinet Ministers, Your Excellency Mr. Nevin Bemitsa, the EU Commissioner for International Cooperation and Development, Your Excellency Ms. Natalia Khanem, the United Nations Under Secretary General, and Executive Director of the United Nations Population Fund, members of the Diplomatic Corps, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I extend a very warm welcome to all who have gathered here today for this important spotlight event, especially those who have traveled from overseas to attend uh, the meetings in Samoa this week and specifically for this event. I congratulate and commend the EU and the United Nations for this significant program that will support countries around the world, including our Pacific nations, to further reinforce existing measures and interventions to end all forms of violence against women and girls. Samoa reaffirms its uh, commitment to the promotion and protection of human rights of all persons and to advancing our efforts to address discrimination against women. The social economic well-being of our people remains at the core of Samoa's development initiatives. We continue to strive towards equality and inclusion to uh, ensure that all Samoans, particularly our women and girls, children and persons with disabilities benefit equitably from economic and social progress. We also continue to commit efforts to combating all forms of violence against women and children by promoting safe families and communities. Two important uh, studies have been carried out on family safety and family violence by the Ministry of Women, Community and Social Development, and our National Human Rights Institution, which reported a high prevalence of violence in the family, and in particular against women and children. The Family Violence Report by the NHRI was uh, the first of its kind for Samoa and the Pacific region. The report put a spotlight on gender-based violence through its wide consultation process, which included village consultations, public and closed hearings, and written submissions. The input from courageous survivors of violence 
were crucial. The sad and alarming findings leaves no more room for excuses, and it's time to focus on action. That is why this spotlight event and initiative is uh, timely. It should help continue to lift the veil of silence, hiding the realities of family violence and keep the spotlight on gender-based violence. I would continue to call upon our political leaders, traditional and religious leaders, fathers and families to acknowledge the widespread pain and suffering in which we are all complicit. Enough is enough. Gender-based violence violates the core principles and values of Faloalo, uh, Vatapuya, and Alofa, amongst others, which are the essence of our Fasamo and faith. For Samoa, we need a whole of country approach to address this issue. With more proactive leadership by us all, the government, village councils, and church leaders, and strong partnerships with all relevant stakeholders and listening to the voices of the survivors. Today, the European Union and the United Nations with our Pacific leaders, representatives of development partners and civil society organizations, have come together to initiate conversations and strengthen partnerships to eliminate domestic violence in the Pacific. The success of the Spotlight Initiative in the Pacific depends on our commitment as leaders, the support of our partners, and the engagement of our communities. As leaders of the Pacific, the change must always begin with us. May today's discussions be meaningful and promising. I thank you. Thank you, Honorable Prime Minister, for a warm welcome, and also um, highlighting some of the issues of um, violence against women and girls here in Samoa, and as well as um, touching base on some of um, the mechanisms to go about in addressing um, violence against women and girls. Um, on that note, may I now invite to the floor our second speaker, Mr. Nevin Mimitsa, the Commissioner for International Cooperation and Development of the European Union for his statement. Reverend Bragwan, Honorable Prime Minister, Executive Director, uh, Dr. Natalia Khanem, Your Excellencies, Mr. President, Prime Ministers, Ministers, dear colleagues and friends, on behalf of the European Union, it is an honor for me to be here at this high-level discussion on the Spotlight Initiative in the Pacific. First of all, I would like to thank Reverend James Bagwan for being here and giving us his support in the fight to end violence against women. My warmest thanks also to you, Mr. Prime Minister, for accepting to host this meeting and for being here today. I'm truly moved looking around this room and seeing all of us gathered together for the same significant reason to end all violence against women and girls, and to end it once and for all. We all know the statistics, but these statistics don't always reveal the full scale of the problem. In Europe, only about a third of women, women who are physically or sexually abused by their, uh, by their partners contact the authorities. We are making this lack of comparable and reliable data a priority in the European Union with the pilot project survey. 
because the first step in fighting gender-based violence is having the full picture of how many lives it affects in Europe and across the world. In the Pacific, two out of three women have experienced physical or sexual violence by an intimate partner. Here again, it is important to understand the broader context and the root causes, even the less obvious ones. With the Pacific region experience, uh, experiencing a first-hand climate change and natural disasters, we need, for instance, to pay particular attention to data showing that uh, women are at greater risk of gender-based violence after climate-related hazards. Domestic and sexual violence is not a local or regional phenomenon. It is a worldwide societal problem, a human rights violation it is, a story we see every day and we cannot continue to look away. It is the story of survivors like Mrs. Tuiloma Sina Retsliev, who we'll hear from during the panel discussion. Tuiloma Sina Retslav tells her own story of domestic violence. She tells the stories of other survivors, and she fights so that these stories do not become anyone else's story. Collectively, all of us here today are here to help break this cycle because the scourge of domestic violence will not be stopped by one person, one organization, or one country alone. When I speak about this collective effort, I think of leaders and governments in the Pacific region. I think of male advocates like Melki Anton. I think of civil society leaders such as the tireless director of the Tonga Women and Children's Crisis Center, Ofa Gutenberg, and young activist Betty Barker. And I think of faith communities and their leaders like Reverend James Bagwan. I am proud that the EU-funded Pacific Partnership launched last November is contributing to this collective effort to promote gender equality prevent violence against women and girls, and help survivors. <clears throat> so the movement is gathering momentum, and we are making headway. But we can do more. The Spotlight Initiative gives this boost. Under a unique model of partnership, and in the true spirit of multilateralism, Spotlight renews the European Union's and the United Nations commitment to end all forms of violence against women and girls, to support human rights and gender equality all around the world, to give women and girls the chance they deserve to shine, to give every single girl and women a voice and a choice. We can only do this together with partner governments and the civil society in the Pacific fully on board. Spotlights built on your ongoing efforts to address the root causes of violence against women and girls, to fill the legislative and policy gaps, to provide quality services for survivors and their families, and to change deep-rooted stigmas and attitudes forever. Today, we are starting a first round of consultations between governments, civil society, and development partners in the Pacific to decide how to design Spotlight's 50 million euros program. I look forward to this discussion and to hearing your ideas. We are here to listen and to understand. During my time in the Pacific, I am learning a lot about the region's cultures and traditions. So allow me to finish with a Marshallese proverb, va kuk va jimor. This proverb highlights togetherness, collaboration, and partnerships through a community's work to build a canoe. These same values underpin Spotlight Initiative. Through respect, love, inclusiveness, and partnership, we can have a great impact in advancing human rights and gender equality in the Pacific, 
and all around the world. Thank you for, your, for uh, being here today, and I really look forward for, to our joint efforts to make Spotlight Initiative effective and functional here in the Pacific. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Mimitsa, for your remarks. Uh, we will now invite Ms. Natalia Kanem, the Executive Director for the United Nations Provident Fund, for her statement. Thank you so much. <laughs> Reverend Bagwan, Honorable Prime Minister, Commissioner, Excellencies, Honorable Ministers, Distinguished Delegates, colleagues of the United Nations, members of civil society, ladies and gentlemen, young people, I bring you greetings of peace. On behalf of the United Nations Secretary General, Mr. Antonio Guterres, our Deputy Secretary General, Amina J. Mohammed, and the heads of my Spotlight Initiative sister agencies, UNDP, UN Women, and UNICEF, I'm here to affirm our joint commitment to ending violence against women by the year 2030. Violence against women and girls is one of the most widespread, persistent, and devastating human rights violations in our world today. It poses a threat to all of us and to global peace and development. Today, one in four children around the world live in households where their mother is subjected to violence. This leads to long-term health and social consequences for girls and boys who witness violence in the home. Too many women continue to suffer gender-based violence. We know that violence against women and girls is rooted in unequal power dynamics within families, communities, and nations in a male-dominated world. We also know that ending violence against women and realizing gender equality are top priorities for the United Nations, the European Union, and the Pacific Islands Forum, as stated in its Gender Equality Declaration. We cannot fulfill the Sustainable Development Goals and the Pacific Forum Leaders' Vision for, quote, a region of peace, harmony, security, social inclusion, and economic prosperity, end quote, unless we end gender inequality and violence against women. The Spotlight Initiative, a global multi-year partnership between the European Union and the United Nations, is an example of the multilateralism we need to solve the world's great challenges. And I would like to thank Commissioner Mimitsa for his leadership and tireless efforts to champion the Spotlight Initiative. We would not be where we are today without the clear vision and commitment to end violence against women and girls that you've shown. Thank you for that. Today's event marks the start of a conversation between Pacific Island governments regional bodies, religious leaders, civil society, and women on how we can better prevent violence in our homes, our schools, and our communities. The Spotlight Initiative provides a critical opportunity for us to address the most prevalent form of violence in the world, intimate partner or domestic violence. The Pacific region has the highest recorded rates of violence against women and girls in the world. Seven countries in the region have prevalence rates above 50%. Women's lifetime experience of violence, including sexual violence, in the Pacific ranges from 25% to as high as 68%. Much work has been done to better understand violence against women here in the Pacific. I would like to thank colleagues and partners for the No VAW Data Initiative. By collecting and monitoring data and using it to influence policies and programs, 
we accelerate progress together. We also see that women who are trained to conduct surveys, who interview other women, often undergo incredibly emotional transformative experiences. Their lives change and they want to continue working to improve the lives of other women. And this builds a powerful movement. We are making progress and we must keep moving forward. I'm pleased that there is a new gender-based violence counseling course by the United Nations and partners that aims to strengthen counseling services to support survivors of gender-based violence in the Pacific. By building capacity, we can reach more women and support their rights and their healing. Through the Spotlight Initiative, we, the European Union and the United Nations, will commit 50 million euros to fund a new program to end domestic violence and leave no one behind, building on the existing work in the region, such as the Pacific Partnership, and engaging civil society, intergovernmental partners, governments in the UN, the Spotlight Initiative Pacific investment seeks to fill gaps and address the most critical needs to end violence against women and girls in the region. When women and girls are empowered and can live lives free of violence and discrimination, we can take greater steps together to achieve the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. So let us work together to make sure that all of our women and girls are safe and can live their lives to the fullest potential. I thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Natalia Kanem, and um, the rest of our distinguished speakers for their remarks. That, ladies and gentlemen, um, concludes our formal remarks or statements for the opening of this event. We will now watch a short video clip about the Spotlight Initiative in the Pacific. It is a promotional tool to reinforce the message on eliminating violence against women and girls in the Pacific and to put in light in the spotlight so that we can work, work to address it. Um, this will also set the scene for our next session. And that, ladies and gentlemen, ends the first part of this session. Um, we will now begin the second part, which is the panel discussion. Um, on my left is our distinguished panel members with extensive experiences and knowledge um, in this space, ranging from reps from the civil societies, faith-based, youth, regional organization, and activists. But before we begin our panel discussions, we will first hear a statement from Reverend Bakwan, um, the General Secretary of Pacific Council of Pacific Conference of Churches. Thank you, Kini. Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is not a sermon. It may sound like one, but it's not. Um, I'd like to begin by expressing my sincere appreciation to the EU and the UN for the inclusion of communities of faith in this gathering and this fledgling partnership. It is part of a growing reaffirmation of the leadership and influential roles 
of churches and other faith communities across the Pacific by the international community. Something that we Pacific Islanders have tried to explain in secular contexts. It builds on the role in our contemporary Pacific society to connecting our spiritual worldviews that extend beyond time and place and beyond land, sea and sky, beyond the human, beyond the secular and even beyond our culture. I represent a community of 30 churches and nine national councils of churches across the millions of square kilometers of the Pacific Ocean. We are connected by our Christian faith and also our belief in the role of faith communities as agents of social change and in particular the potential for faith communities to be agents of societal transformation in eliminating violence against women and girls. But before speaking on what faith communities across our region are doing and what stronger partnerships can achieve in the work to eliminate violence against women and girls, I must acknowledge that for too long, and more often than not, faith communities have been part of the structural violence enacted upon women of all ages and social status in the Pacific. Patriarchal structures of leadership and decision making, biblical interpretation and attitudes towards women in faith communities have underpinned the psychological, emotional, physical, sexual and economic violence that women in the Pacific have had to endure. I acknowledge the complicit and implicit actions and inaction by those in positions of authority and responsibility. I acknowledge the abuses of power and trust experienced by women and children in our Pacific churches. That there are places where the gospel of love, inclusion, preference for the least among us in society, and of peace and abundant life for all is preached and held out as the ideal, but not practiced. At the same time, I acknowledge with gratitude the many mothers and fathers who have had the courage to address these and other forms of gender-based violence experienced in homes, churches, and church institutions for more than two decades. In their local churches, in national churches, and the Pacific Conference of Churches membership and those sisters and brothers working with us to continue and strengthen this work. This is part of a global move by Christian communities to address all forms of abuse of power and trust. There is a growing shift by member churches of the PCC from a conservative, colonial, fundamentalist and patriarchal theology to one based on more inclusive and contextual biblical interpretation and strong Christian theological and ethical reflection that violence against women and children in all its forms is a sin. That it goes against the understanding, the Christian understanding of God's intention for human relationships. Just as Pacific Forum leaders recognized that a high level commitment was needed to progress gender equality through the Pacific Forum leaders gender equality declaration and endorsed the Pacific Regional Action Plan on Women, Peace and Security. Church leaders across the region are engaging in theological approaches to challenge cultural norms that perpetuate the root causes of violence against women. In order to effect, be effective in this work, our theological approach must be prophetic in terms of speaking truth to power, both in the church and in wider society. It must be pastoral in terms of trauma counseling, working with local church communities to address violence against women and children, as well as the issue of masculinity and violence. And it must be practical, a consolidated, consistent, and strategic approach from grassroots congregations to leadership that includes theological colleges and the different departments and fellowships in our churches, that addresses the issue of leadership and participation in both decision-making in church institutions and in terms of ministry and worship. At a time when our Pacific region faces high levels of violence and low levels of political representation, when we still have the unfinished business of progressing gender equality, the right to self-determination and peaceful societies, we are speaking out against violence against women and children to their own communities of faith and wider society. In Fiji and Vanuatu, the message goes beyond the pulpit through mass and social media campaigns 
to remind our communities of a key message, that our faith says no to rape, no to violence against women, and that any form of violence against women is a sin. I'd like to share with you an example of this advocacy. Tayum tainarum svargadate vida sirendate. Sokyo manda akhiye jit jamme rajan. Asambulia na tamata na kalo me to bateki koya. Ene to boli kalo sambuli koya ko koya. Na tangane ke ne lewa sambuli rao ko koya. Et kehta hai jis ghar me mahilao ka aadar hota hai wahan parivar sukhi rehta hai. My commandment is this love one another. Just as I have loved you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam istausu bin nisa'i khaira. Amar Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam nirshad farmaya. Auroto ke saath halai ka mamla kiya karo. Yatra pujayante nariyesu, tatra ramanta devataha. Jaha nari ka samman hota hai, waha parmeswar ka vas hota hai. From the beginning, woman like man was created and placed by God with a common dignity. Siya Ram may sab jag jani kara hu pranam jod yug pani Sanatan dharm samast sansar ko Ram may janti hai isi liye sab ke khilaf hinsa varjit hai. My faith says no. 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 My faith say no. My faith says no to rape and violence against women and children. Pastorally, theological institutions for ordained and lay ministry formation have for some time had access to curricula on gender-based violence produced by the South Pacific Association for Theological Schools. Across the Pacific, particularly in Melanesia, communities of practice of gender equality theology are being developed by PCC member churches and national councils of churches, facilitated by Uniting World, the development agency of the Uniting Church in Australia. The Anglican Diocese of Polynesia has recently launched its Sasa Faith program, a faith-based approach to encourage gender equality and stop violence against women and girls that is often accepted as a normal, a social norm. There is also initiatives for church to break the silence on the issue and discuss in local faith communities from the pulpit in Bible study groups. These are examples of what the churches across Melanesia, Micronesia and Polynesia are doing to shine the spotlight to eliminate violence against women and girls. Practically, there is more to eliminating violence against women that needs to be done in the area of structural violence, particularly in the area of women's participation in ministry and leadership in faith communities. And we affirm the recommendation of the Pacific Platform for Action on Gender Equality and Women's Rights, adopted at the 2013 Pacific Women's Triennial Conference, that this requires innovative and multi-stakeholder approaches to be truly transformative. As the Pacific faces the impact of climate change and intensifying disasters, we know we must be part of supporting the shift in power to uplift women as first responders and as the voice and leaders of building resilient and sustainable communities. This, re this requires a comprehensive coordination mechanism between member churches and National Council of Churches and other stakeholders and partners. The Pacific Conference of Churches is committed to providing this crucial role as part of its mandate from our General Assembly, which includes resolutions from our women's pre-assembly. In order to do so, we're taking a leaf out of the UN's book here, I am happy to announce that the Pacific Conference of Churches under its Commission on Mission and Theology, will be convening the first commission on the status of women in Pacific churches to take place in 2020, with a follow-up commencing from 2022. It is hoped that this commission will be a sustained intervention for churches as a method of monitoring, truth-telling, 
accountability in advocating not only gender-based violence, but also structural violence, including women's participation and leadership in Pacific churches. While it may seem to those outside the church that this is a big step, we see this as the necessary and natural step for our communities of faith in this issue. Already we have had initial conversations with the Regional Rights Resource Team of the Pacific Community, the Pacific Office of UN Women and the Pacific Islands Forum, and I look forward to the support of the Spotlight Initiative through the Pacific Partnership to End Violence Against Women and other stakeholders as we work together for long-term and deeper societal change. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the church is in the business of conversion, of social transformation. Let us work together for safe and peaceful homes, communities and faith communities, so that our saved communities are safe communities for women, children, and all vulnerable children of God. Thank you. Okay, wow. Um, I, you have truly um, given us a feeling or um, uh, emotions in leading into our panel discussions. Um, I think everyone will agree with me by thanking you, Reverend, for your courage and commitment to be able to stand before this audience today and um, speak about some of the issues um, that are faced by women and girls in the Pacific in the space of church. Um, highlighting the commitments and initiatives also by the churches in moving together towards this movement, movement um, to end violence against women and girls. So um, on that note, once again, thank you very much, um, Reverend, for that um, courageous and uh, very uplifting and motivating um, statement. Um, we will now begin our, our panel discussions. Um, to my panelists, um, for the purposes of, of our discussions for today, um, I have two questions um, that I will ask of all of you. I will go around asking the first question, then come back and follow up with the second question. Now, panel members, we have heard from statements from the Honorable Prime Minister of Samoa, the Commissioner for International Cooperation and Development of the European Union, and Executive Director of UNP UNFPA on a systemic view of violence against women and girls, not only within the Pacific, but also around the world. Um, with specifically to our discussions, we would like to draw from your first-hand knowledge and experiences on the ground level that contributes to the elimination of violence against um, women and girls in the Pacific. Now with our first question, I will be asking Ms. Um, Tuiloma Sina Retzleff, and then I will continue on with, with each of our panel members. Ms. Tuiloma, in your capacity as a survivor of domestic violence, what is your understanding of violence against women and girls in the Pacific? Thank you. And I think you gave us three minutes. Is that, is that right, Kimi? Uh, all protocols observed, it is an absolute blessing to be here. There are many forms of violence against women and girls. Uh, my research and experience, and therefore response today, will focus on intimate partner violence. Uh, that is the violence or the abusive behavior uh, by a man towards a woman that he is in an intimate relationship with, or acts of violence by a husband towards his wife, or from the perspective of our children, by father against their mother. What it looks like is that the abuser uses certain patterns of behavior to establish and maintain power and control over their partner. And yes, although often it includes physical violence, Physical violence doesn't have to be necessarily present. I want to move into some of that. There is verbal abuse, the name calling, the put downs. You're fat, you're ugly, you're stupid, you're a whore. There is emotional abuse where the perpetrator, now remember, this is an intimate partner relationship. So these people know each other better than anyone else. And so in emotional abuse, your partner knows exactly how to tear your emotions apart. And so they'll use your children or your favorite pet or even property, anything at all that is dear to you 
to, in, to pass this, this abuse, emotional abuse. Recently, more recently, there is social and reputational abuse I want to spotlight. Because particularly nowadays with women climbing and progressing in their careers, this is where your partner will threaten to tell your employer what you're really like. Now there are many ways that abusers will exert their abuse upon their victims. But again, I want to highlight or spotlight in the time that I have two. One is isolation and one is intimidation. Now isolation, that is the control of what she does, who she sees, who she talks to, where she goes, just limiting her access and involvement to the outside world. Isolation is where they say, I just want it to be you and me, baby. Isolation is where if you have a friend and you haven't seen her for a long time and because she's been with a new partner, that is a distinct early warning sign. The second is using intimidation, making her feel constantly afraid by a threatening voice. This can be subtle. It can be the use of looks or actions or gestures, or it can be obvious, like displaying weapons around the house. As an example, in a room completely full of people, the abuser's look from across the room can send deafening silent messages to his partner or his victim. And that only she can read from across the room. My final point in the time, thank you, Mindy, is that to understand intimate partner violence is to understand and appreciate the difference between causes and triggers. These violent, abusive behaviors that two out of three Pacific women have to live with is not caused by alcohol. It is not caused by a mother attending a weekly bingo for the church. It is not caused by anger or stress or financial situation of problems. When we speak this way, we displace responsibility from the abuser. We're almost justifying their actions or giving him an excuse for the shameful acts of abuse. He came home drunk and the children weren't fed and there was no food on the table. Therefore, that is what happened. That is why it happened. Mother went to the bingo and that is why stepfather crawled into stepdaughter's eight-year-old eight -year stepdaughter's room and sexually violated her. If only she didn't go to the bingo. We must be careful that we use this, our language carefully. It is caused by gender inequality that dates right back to biblical times. Two grown adults engage in an act of infidelity and society wanted to stone the woman to death. There is no mention of what happened to the male in that story. Sorry, Sina, it is rooted in power sure. and control. This is my last point. It is caused and it happens because our boys, our sons are growing up watching fathers beating mothers, watching uncles beating aunties, watching pastor beating pastor's wife, watching matai or chief beating chief's wife. And so our boys, our children, our girls even start to believe that that is the norm and they start to think that it is okay. That is why it happens. Thank you, Tulo Mom. We'll now move on to our panel member um, two, Dr. Collins Tsukuitongo. Um, Dr. Collins, you are the Director General of Secretariat of Pacific Community, um, SBC being the lead regional agency which provides scientific and technical assistance to the Pacific Island countries to help them address development issues. In your capacity as Director General, what is your understanding of violence against women in the Pacific? Well, I think that uh, you've heard the statistics uh, for our region. Uh, my understanding of violence against women is uh, counter to the values of uh, Pacific uh, families and societies outlined by the Prime Minister. My understanding of violence against women, it, it's horrible, uh, that it's akin uh, to uh, cancer, silent, destructive, uh, uh, robs uh, women mainly of their dignity, and if it's not checked, it can kill them. In other words, it's clearly one of our most uh, challenging societal uh, phenomena. Uh, equality has been uh, mentioned several times, and let me just uh, focus on that uh, specifically now. 
uh, in other words, violence against uh, women is a manifestation of uh, inequality. Uh, and so we, we need to address uh, inequality. Um, we need to address structural barriers to ensure substantive equality between uh, men and women, uh, to remove or to make it easier for women and girls to overcome the systemic and structural uh, barriers to equality, to equitable access to positions of influence and in decision making in business, in parliament, in uh, community and so on. Uh, in our region, as has been referred to, we have the lowest percentage of women in Parliament. In uh, Papua New Guinea, in uh, Vanuatu, and in uh, Micronesia, there are no women in Parliament. And on average, we have less than 7% of uh, Parliament uh, where women are represented. The second thing I would comment would be on the formal uh, equality uh, issues in addition to substantive equality. Uh, formal equality, uh, sorry, ensure that our laws uh, do not uh, discriminate uh, against women and girls or restrict their opportunities and rights in the areas of employment, social protection, decision making, land ownership, and the rest. Uh, legislation, of course, is not enough. Uh, there's a need to ensure adequate uh, compliance and that resources are available uh, to enforce uh, and implement and enforce uh, legislation. I think, uh, personally, I think economic empowerment is a big one. Uh, many women in our region uh, are not in formal employment and, the, and they're heavily dependent on their partners. It's a generalization uh, and uh, clearly this needs to happen. Uh, by way of creating uh, economic uh, opportunities, uh, by creating uh, assistance uh, for women who have limited access, as you know, to capital and the necessary resources uh, to be more economically independent. Um, when violence against women is not uh, addressed, it makes it difficult for women to engage in economic uh, initiatives. Um, and the last point I'd make here is, uh, again, references have been made to uh, starting early about uh, encouraging, informing, and supporting uh, young boys, young men, uh, and young women in the school environment about what is normal, healthy uh, relationships. And so these interventions uh, need to take place early in the school. And I have to say, I'm not sure that we're doing a particularly good job on this in our region uh, about uh, informing, educating, supporting uh, young men and women to treat uh, each other respectfully and what a healthy, uh, mature relationship uh, would look like. Thank you, Dr. Collins. We will move on to our panel member number three, Ms. Betty. In your capacity as a youth representative or a young activist, what is your understanding of violence against women and girls in the Pacific? Thank you, Kini. Um, it definitely is an honor and privilege to be in this room. Um, in my understanding and comparative to the panel, in my limited decade of experience in the area, what's been, def what's been very clear is that violence against women, sexual and gender-based violence, intimate partner violence isn't just a Pacific issue, it's definitely a global issue. But when you look at the numbers per capita, it is a major Pacific issue. Given the size of our populations, it is something that definitely concerns each and every one of us. And despite the growth in initiatives committed to changing the mindsets in communities, it, things can be done better and we need to do things better and accelerate it. Um, compounding factors for young people, such as unemployment, the intensity of natural disasters, impacts of climate change, only add to things that already existed. For example, cultural, social, and structural barriers that already limited young people into, that already limited young people's access into these spaces are now just adding on. And the data is clear. 
the numbers are out there. But for this, and for the very reason that we need to highlight Pacific stories, we need qualitative analysis. We need the stories from our region to be told. The numbers don't speak of the realities. Um, I think in this instance, I'd like to share with you an example of our grantee partners um, in Kiribati who, looking at the community violence in their village, decided to meet every evening on the beach side and talk about how, they, how best they could combat this as a community in the village. Um, in the last four years, they have lost the so-called space where they used to get together, which was the beach because the sea, because of sea level rise. Now they are confined to the very walls where they are violated to seek refuge. Um, finally, I think, actually, intimate partner violence and echoing the words of uh, my sister Sina here, um, intimate partner violence, violence against women, sexual and gender-based violence cannot and should not be held in isolation. They are very much connected to everything else that is compounding young people's restrictions and access to opportunities. And we truly need to examine the interlinkages between the instigating factors of why this is still happening and why numbers are still going high. We can no longer take the high numbers of reporting as an indication that awareness is going right. This is not how it is. At one stage it was, but something has to change. And I think um, initiatives that boost in the region are lacking. And I think that's what young people in the region are looking for. Thank you. Thank you, Bet Thank you Betsy. Uh, moving on to Ms. Offa. As the Director General of the Tonga Women and Children's Crisis Center, what is your understanding of violence against women in the Pacific? Up until 17 years ago, I didn't believe that violence against women and girls was an issue in Tonga. And to be honest with you, I didn't even know what its status was throughout the Pacific. But then again, 17 years ago, I was a privileged 27-year-old young woman working for a quasi-government institution, fresh out of postgraduate studies, and a very self-centered human being. I grew up in a very strong traditional family unit. I never saw my father hit my mother. I was never beaten up by my parents. I had all the support and encouragement to be the best that I could be. I had access to educational opportunities in New Zealand. I returned to Tonga and was immediately employed. I eventually married a wonderful human being who to this day has never used violence on me. So what do I know about violence? To make a long story short, Kenny, I didn't know or understand what violence looked like on a personal level. My life was very privileged. But then, 17 years ago, God changed that trajectory and placed me right in the space of ending violence against women and girls' work in Tonga. I didn't know or understand why I was in this line of work at first, but as soon as I started to stop and listen to the women and girls' stories who were experiencing violence, my whole entire life changed. Exactly what we heard this morning, listen to the voice of the survivors as expressed by the Honourable Prime Minister and the transformative experience expressed by Dr Natalia. That's exactly what I experienced. So now my understanding of violence in Tonga over the last 17 years has changed dramatically. I take this opportunity now to name the types of violence that I have been exposed to frontline over the last 17 years in the evil space in Tonga. Some of the violence I will mention is violence that I would have never in a million years imagined would happen in my little island Tonga. But also noting that these types of violence is not just violence that happens in Tonga, it happens everywhere in the world and indeed the Pacific. I acknowledge my sister Sina who has expressed uh, and given you examples of um, emotional and psycho psychological violence. So I will cut down some of the violence to what I have experienced and have not heard yet on this panel. Kicking, punching, pulling of hair, biting of body parts, 
burning of body parts, stabbing using knives and glass, cutting off hair, shaving all the hair off, spitting in food, on food and making the victim eat it, urinating on the victim's face, pouring of hot water on body parts, tying up the woman on a naked, to a na to, naked to a tree, locking her up in the bedroom for days with little food or water, drowning her in the ocean, cutting her inner thighs, making her eat rocks, making her lick food off the floor, using tapioca during sexual intercourse, making the victim watch pornographic movies and acting exactly what she sees in the movie, making victim have sex with other men while the perpetrator watches, kicking the pregnant victim in the stomach. I could go on and on and on, and this is all what I have been exposed to in Tonga. But if I were to highlight two understandings, my personal understanding, understanding of what does violence look like in Tonga, the first is that you have to listen actively. When you listen actively to the story of the survivor, you will not only hear the problem and the root causes and the contributing factors that you've heard the panelists talk about earlier, you will also see the solution because you will see the gaps in her access to justice where it's denied, in her access to um, be given support services where it's denied. It's all there if you just sit and listen to the survivor's story. And secondly, and lastly, Kenny, in all the years that I have worked in the Ending Violence Against Women's Space in Tonga, in the last 17 years, I have not met one woman, one survivor, who has come to me after the first experience of violence. Not one. All the women and girls I have dealt with, sorry, the women, I have had young girls after the first experience of violence, but all the women I have dealt with in the last 17 years, not one has come to me after her first experience of violence. It's after years, months of experiencing violence that she finally gets the courage to walk through our doors and ask for help. That's my understanding of violence. Thank you, Ofa. And save the best for last, um, Vera James. <laughs> Do you have anything to add on to what um, your colleagues have already provided for us? I think um, we've heard the reality. Um, I just want to add that one of the challenges in this issue is the perpetuation of stereotypes that enable this cycle of violence to continue. And one of those agents is a distorted interpretation of the Bible. Mm. That, uh, for example, in the book of Ephesians, wives, obey your husbands. I forget that just after that, they're told, husbands, love your wives as Jesus loved, your, loved the church. So it's, it's a big challenge for us in how we address the uh, the, the continuation and how we use uh, the scriptures to break the cycle rather than to perpetuate the cycle of violence. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, um, panelists, for um, the insightful experiences that you have um, provided on the question given to you. Um, I think you have really highlighted that the issues of violence against women and girls is not an issue that is specific um, to the Pacific, um, but it is a, a global issue. It is not only an issue that is specific to only Samoa or um, Fiji or Tonga. Violence against women and girls um, does not discriminate to any one country. Um, it's a major human rights violation across um, the Pacific, and you have clearly um, highlighted that. We, you have highlighted issues looking at cultural and social barriers, um, highlighting how horrible examples of um, violence against women and girls cited from Tuiloma and also Ofa. But there is one issue that I wanted to highlight from this discussion, which is also an issue which I think interlinks with all the issues that you've already raised, is the impact of the lack of understanding between root causes and triggers of violence. Um, 
this is one of the issues that was heavily discussed in the inquiry report. Um, understanding the distinction is not often made, but it is important to do so as classifying triggers as causes, as we've heard, can often shift the responsibility away from the perpetrator and contributes to the continuation of violence. Um, we've heard from how this also contributes to the normalization of violence against um, women and girls. Um, violence has become part or been accepted as part of life for most people in our society, and it goes unnoticed. Um, this in itself contributes to the continuation of the cycle of violence. Um, not understanding the differences between these two terms also deflects the attention from the true root cause of family violence, and that is gender inequality and power and control, which um, Dr. Uh, Tukitonga alluded to in his presentation as well and across the panel, um, as one of the main issues across the Pacific. Um, looking at sustain, subs, substantive and formal equality. Um, and this is also a critical area that needs unpacking in the Pacific to understand that it is a root cause of um, family violence. And lastly, with what Revan um, has touched on, is on the misconception um, that validates violence against women and girls based on the wrongful interpretations of the scriptures, which further perpetuates or reinforces the attitudes that contributes to violence. Um, as I've said earlier, these issues are common across the Pacific, and which begs the question then, what is the Pacific region doing about it? And how are we addressing this issue in our prospective countries? I know that you briefly touched on that um, in some of your um, presentation, but then this will lead us to our second question, um, which is, we'll go first with um, Tuiloma. In your experience as a domestic violence research fellow, what have been some of the key strategies you have used and found effective when engaging various stakeholders, such as government, institutions, CSOs, to address violence against women in the Pacific and girls? Thanks, Giddy. Definitely the holistic approach, definitely the nationwide approach that our leaders have alluded to already, and it's, and it's exactly what the Spotlight Initiative highlights as key elements as well. There are three pillars I really believe that need to be worked on as an approach going forward, but they have to be interlinked and worked on together. First of all, we need communication and awareness strategies, and there's a lot of communication and awareness out there, but it has to be based and designed on understanding the issue. We're talking about changing mindsets here, changing attitudes, and changing norms. So you need to be robust. You need to, you need to have a dynamic, practical uh, communication awareness strategy out there. I'll give a, a, one of the successes in Samoa has been uh, training that has been rolled out to the media. Uh, six years ago, uh, an abused woman would be reported in the media as she, she was divorced at the time, but she walked out of a restaurant and her ex-husband had beaten her, and so the media reported it as his wife was walking out of the restaurant with a man and therefore he beat her. No mention of a divorce. But again, there was mentioned as an isolated incident, and it was mentioned with almost using an explanation for what had happened. Fast forward Samoa into 2019, and we are faced right now with two, one fatal case and one very serious case where the victim is, is recovering. Our media have shown such a high level of professionalism, and they have shown such a high level of understanding in the reporting of those cases that we are currently facing in Samoa. When I say that, they are not isolating the incident, they are not zooming in you know, to focus on uh, the woman was shot, the woman who was doing this and was wearing that and was being such and such was shot. We are now learning to report it as the man who is a commercial farmer who lives somewhere shot the woman. Right? So we are, we are changing the dynamic of that conversation and that has been one of the success items. We need to support uh, core response groups. And when I say that, it's everybody. It's, it's the pastor's wife that they run to for help. It's the police, it's the fine emergency services, it's nurses, it's, it's everybody that teaches, everybody that the survivor or the victim wants to go and talk to, they need to have our support. And when we talk about that, we talk about NGOs who are working in this space. And while we are on 
the NGOs who work in this space, they must be commended for filling a gap that often our governments are not filling. We have a Samoa victim support group here in Samoa, and they have all of the victims of incest because, well, actually, the husband and the wife don't want them around anymore because they've just shown a light on things. And finally, we need to have our legislative frameworks in place, and that is a lot of good work has already been done in this space, but our courts must be ready and our legislations must be ready. When I say that all these things must be interlinked, and I'll give this as an example, how am I doing with time? When we have an awareness program that says, break the silence, stop the violence, we are calling out to our, to our victims, we're calling out to survivors to step forward and report their abusers, correct? Break the silence, stop the violence. While we do more harm to them when we do a communication strategy like that, when they move forward to report and we are not ready. Our infrastructure is not in place. Our police domestic violence unit is not, is not ready. Our court system is not ready. There is no halfway house for them to go to temporarily. So we have no right to call on people and call on victims and women to step forward and report their abusers when society and our infrastructure is not ready to catch them as a safety net when they do that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tuloma. Um, we will now move on to Dr. Collins. Um, SBC has done considerable work around this space in the Pacific. Could you highlight to us some of the key strategies SBC have used and found effective when engaging various stakeholders, such as government, institutions, CSO, to address the issue of violence against women and girls? Well, SBC uh, obviously does a, a lot. We've been in the business for some several years now, but I, let me just make a couple of uh, general remarks first. One is effective. Uh, when you say effective, that's uh, a big ask. We do a lot. Uh, is it effective? Well, that's an open question. If it's effective, why are we still talking about it? So, yes, of course, there are uh, some, some, some successes here and there. But uh, the, the battle against uh, violence against women and girls, it, we, we haven't won it yet. It's not effective. So I would just ask us to reflect on that. Mm. The other is the temptation to think about uh, single interventions and economic intervention, a leadership intervention. Uh, what uh, is needed is really a social movement that incorporates all of these things. Until there's a change up here, uh, that is embraced by everyone, that violence against women and girls is unacceptable, we haven't done anything. Uh, single interventions that have an impact here and there, yes, it's a success, but it's not enough. For SBC, we take a multi-sectoral, multi-dimensional, holistic and rights-based uh, approach. We are the implementing agency for the EU and Australian government-funded partnership to end violence against women and girls. Uh, the program brings together uh, governments and civil society to promote gender equality and prevent uh, eliminate violence against women. Uh, specifically, we've been helping departments of education in Kiribati, in uh, RMI and Tuvalu to better incorporate human rights and gender equality uh, issues relating to violence against women into the national education uh, curricula, the, the formal education. Uh, in addition, bringing the ministries, the schools, and the school communities together to promote human rights and gender equality, address violence against women, uh, the informal education. Our view is that uh, we need to align the Spotlight Initiative with the Pacific Partnership to End Violence Against Women and Girls and other programs and initiatives which are implemented across the region, and there are many, uh, uh, whether it's uh, crop uh, like ourselves and peace or, or others. I think the danger with the spotlight uh, uh, starting afresh and disconnected from what's going on uh, wouldn't serve anyone any real purpose. Um, our specific interventions relate uh, to um, legislative reform in the domestic violence space, helping uh, countries with that work, strengthening institutions which work to address violence against women, including the courts, uh, national human rights uh, commissions, and so on, supporting civil rights, uh, civil society organizations to address uh, violence against women, gender mainstreaming and gender equality more generally across the region, 
supporting legal aid services for women and girls who are subjected to violence. Uh, for example, in the Solomon Islands Access to Justice uh, Project and the Legal Aid Centre in uh, Tonga. Uh, and the last point I'd make would be uh, around strengthening the capacity of, for data collection and national statistics uh, systems and agencies in their efforts to collect quality, believable uh, data for planning and decision making. So I hope I've given you a flavor of, uh, of what we do. There's obviously a lot more where that came from. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Collins. Yep. <laughs> Betsy, as a member of both the Women Deliver Young Leaders Program and Frida Young Feminist Fund, what are some of the key strategies you have used and found effective when engaging various stakeholders such as government, institutions, CSOs to address the issue of violence against women and girls? Thanks, Kini. Um, I'll take it on from where Dr. Cullen left it and add on to the use of data. Evidence-based advocacy has definitely worked, but evidence-based advocacy and action for our team has worked better. Um, we actually have a grantee partner in Samoa called Brown Girl Woke, and they are engaged in a two-year participatory action research where not only will they be collecting their data, they're not just the researchers and reporters of their data, but the purpose of this participatory action research is for them to work collectively with their communities to find solutions. So it's owned by the community and it's owned by the researchers. So everybody's integrated and held accountable too. Um, and we definitely recognize, and I think the international community also recognizes that there is a huge gap in data availability from the region. And aside from participatory action research from community researchers, I think it's on our academic institutions to step up. We need, to, we need data from the region and pa active partnership to do this. Um, Another thing that's worked for us has been common engagement spaces. Of course, spaces like this where young, our young partners are present to share their stories have been incredible. But youth forums that are held nationally and regionally have worked um, to some extent. Uh, I think there has been general consensus that these youth forums have been great in initiating dialogue but the reflection of the outcomes of these forums in national and regional spaces is yet to be determined. And I think if we're genuinely looking at young people as partners, we need to hold them accountable and say, okay, we're going to hear your voices, but you're going to be partners and we trust you to take this forward. Um, which takes me to my next point, which is on consistent and persistent partnerships. We can't constantly t say that young people are not acting up because in the recent years, young, young Pacific Islanders have been more than engaged in political and social change processes. So we know this, with or without resources, they're doing, the, and they are agents of change. It's about supporting them in their formal and informal networks to continue the incredible work they do. Um, um, not only that, I think it's also important for us to get young people to think solutions. We can create dialogues, we can get them talking, but it's also very important for us to hear what they think are solutions that will work. Approximately 60% of Pacific Island populations are young, and if we want any sustainable transformative change, they need to be a part of the process from the very beginning. If we want this to happen, we need to be willing to engage and take them on as partners from the very beginning. Um, I think lastly, what, what I would like to emphasize is we already know the power of young people in the region. We know that they are an important constituency for engagement, but we need to be pragmatic about how we're engaging with it. We really need to think if this is going to work. There have been great initiatives, there have been lessons learned, there have been practices that we can replicate and make better. I think overall, it's about taking a proactive approach, and especially in the changing times, we know that social media, which has definitely been a major tool for us in engaging with young people in terms of outreach, 
But we also know that social media and internet comes with its pros and cons. We know that there have been lives taken in the region as a result of leaked videos and photographs, and we need to take proactive approaches to take it. So just, just to, um, and I think we need to be preventative, we need to think prevention, we need to be pragmatic, and we need to be proactive. That's the approach we need to take going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Betsy. Thank you. Moving on to Ms. Offa. In your capacity as the Director General for the Tonga Women and Children's Crisis Center, and also an advisor to the Pacific Women's Network against violence against women, what are some of the key strategies you have used and found effective when engaging various stakeholders, such as government, institutions, CSOs, um, in addressing the issue of violence against women and girls? Um, thank you. Yini, um, I just want to bounce off what um, Dr. Colin said earlier. Uh, this is really a time for reflection. Um, there's lots being done, but how effective are those lots of things um, that have been done throughout the Pacific. I just want to highlight a few things, and it's more to do with um, maybe attitudinal change. Uh, one of the things that keeps coming up uh, through partners in the Pacific Women's Network Against Violence Against Women, and indeed in Tonga, one of the challenges we face is we often hear that violence against women is a human rights violation. Well, the biggest challenge to that statement is that a lot of our Pacific peoples uh, see human rights as a foreign flower. So when you say woman, uh, violence against women is a human rights violation, it, it has no meaning because human rights itself is a foreign flower. So one of the strategies that uh, I've used that's been quite effective in Tonga with those who I've been able to have one-on-one -on -one deep and meaningful conversations with who have some kind of power, uh, decision uh, making power, is that I remind them, kindly remind them, that for human rights is not foreign to Tonga. In actual fact, Tonga um, should be uh, noted for being the most progressive countries, if not in the Pacific, but the world. Because if you think of the Universal Declaration uh, of Human Rights, 1947, and then you think of our Tongan constitution, 1875. There's a 72 year gap. Our constitution came 72 years before the UDHR. Why do I say that? Why, well, why am I making an, in no sense at all at this time? It's because there are three parts to the Tongan constitution. The very first part of the Tongan constitution is the rights of the people. So the fact that our king, George the Bolwaki, put together a constitution that had three parts, the first part being prioritized as the rights of the people of Tonga, I think is something that should be recognized throughout the world. And it brings me back to what Ebeli Hau Offa says, a Tongan academic, well, Fiji's claimed him as well, <laughs> um, who often talked about Pacific peoples, the need to stop belittling ourselves. And I think we've allowed the UN and the EU and whoever to claim human rights, when in actual fact, we were quite progressive in our societies, giving our people their rights. It's just that all this kind of, you know, commercialization of human rights in the other part of the world has made us step back and disown it, when in actual fact, it is a very much part of us and who we are. So that's one of the strategies I use. I always remind leaders in the country when they say human rights and it's unbiblical, I say actually it's not. Um, and I leave that to the Rev who's here to take you through that after this if you want to talk about that. But these, those are the kinds of strategies. Last three points, because we're on time. If there's anything that we need to focus on, because I've been in this space for 17 years, I've seen donors come and go, I've seen funds come and go. The things that I would say that's where you need to go and invest some time in to look at some really effective strategies in those spaces. It's church. We need to work with the churches and the church leaders. We need to work with education, which is one of the um, strategies under the Pacific Partnership. We need to go into the curricula as 
early and as soon as possible to teach every little girl and every little boy attending class one, class two, class three, class four, that they are equal to each other and that there's no difference. Because if we don't do that, they're getting exposed to something different at home that's telling them that they are different. And that will transition on into their adult life. And that's the role of the education system. And the male advocacy programs that are out there, male masculinities, the more we can get that out there, getting the police to undergo male masculinity so that they respond better to survivors. These are the three areas that I think we really need to do some work on, including the magistrates in the justice system. Malo. Malo Ofa. <laughs> on that note, Reverend, would you like to um, share some thoughts on what has already been discussed? Yeah, I think um, Ofa just mentioned them all. <laughs> No, just a couple of things very quickly. The, the issue of, of partnership, and I know some governments do engage with faith communities, but some still do not on the issue. And when I talk about engagement, it's the same with uh, international partners and donors. It's not just about we've got a program we want to roll out using you or you as the, the target. It's about development. It's about you know, working together to come up with the long-term strategies because this is a deeply, deeply rooted issue. And we've got to spend time and energy into getting into that. And addressing, being willing to not just go at the symptoms, but work honestly about the root causes. You know, the frustration, the, the political issues, the economic issues that underpin, the climate change issues that underpin uh, the, the violence, the, the issues of inequality that people feel. Um, and finally, you know, one of the, this is what we're trying to do, we're trying to, say that human rights is at one level, the Bible goes deeper. So about shifting the conversation from rights to responsibilities. That it is your responsibility to ensure that equality is practiced, that peace is practiced, that uh, people have safe communities. Thank you. Thank you, Rev. Um, before I wrap up um, with the question, we have a member who uh, unfortunately, he missed his flight, so um, he did a video of his presentation. Um, this is Mr. Melky Anton, part of the Regional Male Advocate, and um, it will be a shame if we go throughout this panel uh, without hearing from him. So we will now... Um... Okay. My understanding of violence against women is actually informed from the context of where I work. So basically, it is any harmful practices that a man does to any woman and these harmful practices can be very abusive, controlling, detrimental to the quality of life, to the health and the well-being of the woman. In this case, in our Pacific communities, many of our women continue to suffer at the ends of men because of the fact that men do not see them in the same way as God has intended in terms of you know being in the image and likeness of God. With that comes the kind of treatment that we continue to experience today. And so many women feel intimidated, inferior, not valued, unimportant. And it's all because men have decided to treat women unequally. And this gender inequality continues to exist in every part of our society. In terms of our strategies, I see that one of the best strategies we can use as far as this funding is concerned or this next wave of investment is concerned is to use it on programs that are actually working. And these programs that are working are those that have been part of the Pacific Women's Network in the Pacific for the last 20 or 30 years. These are the kind of work that these women do in terms of keeping to the message of violence against women, basing their work on the women's experiences of violence and addressing the root causes of GBV right from the beginning and without deviating from it these women have actually stood up for many other women in the pacific by bringing their conscience to the forefront of policies and programs and continue to base those work around the principles of human rights and gender equality this is the reason why they have also developed expertise in the work of prevention and responses to violence against women they have also developed innovations around programs that deal with the root causes of GBV 
and they have also continuously built their programs and their work on the experiences of violence against women with the use of the human rights principles. So without navigating or without deviating from the essence of the matter, I would su suggest strongly that any work in the Pacific right now and any funding and support to it is very, very welcome. And we can truly, truly start seeing some difference and many more differences if we continue to use the expertise that's already available. And it's available within the network that I'm part of as a male advocate and is part of the Pacific region as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for your patience. I know we're going over a little bit over time, um, and I've been asked to cut short, but because this um, dialogue is very important, I just wanted to highlight one main thing that came across from our second question, and that is the collective effort by everyone, and that is why we are all here today, is because this requires a collective effort, not a single approach, not a single initiative, but a collective effort by everyone, starting from the grassroots levels all the way up to our political leaders and our partners. So I just wanted to re-emphasize that from what I can gather from everyone here. In order to make these changes, everyone needs to work together. On that note, I will now open the floor to two interventions. So please kindly bear with us, we're almost done. Um, two interventions from the Honorable Patrick Gomes, the Secretary General of the ACP Group of States, for his statement. Certainly, thank you very much. I've learned a, a lot, and there isn't too much to add other than to reinforce the fact that in the ACP, the African Caribbean Pacific Group of States, we would like to take the entire panel to Brussels for discussion. <laughs> So we are asking Commissioner to see that under the EDF, some of that is provided. I mentioned that uh, partly not too serious, but the interaction and the cross-fertilization, I've heard this presentation, and I felt at times I was in the Caribbean at the University of West Indies in St. Augustine. And from there, I also thought I was at times in Tanzania, out in Iringa, in a rural community with UNICEF many years ago, or if I'm not in Jamaica, with UNFPA. So the key word I thought that came across is this has to be a movement. Dr. Colin was saying that. It's all well and good that we do have these pieces put together and a lot is being done, but unless we can let them coalesce for cumulative impact, it would not be able to go forward. And therefore, we cannot lose contact with each other. We have to continue to build the interaction and carry it forward. And that's why the ACP sees itself as a, a facilitator, as a hub, as a catalyst. And we intend, that's why we're here for the post Kutunu, also to unpack and to repack and to build in a lot more the experiences, the real experiences, so that they can carry us to another level. I want to say thanks very much for allowing me to be here and to learn so much. And I think that we want to continue the work and I'll make sure that on behalf of the ACP and along with the European Commission through the EDVF Development Fund, we are able to see that this work goes forward. It is vitally important. It's the number one issue to be dealt with as far as development is concerned. So thank you very much. Um, our second intervention is from the Honorable Ms. Faustina uh, Rehuga Maruk, um, the Minister of State of Palau. Thank you. The, the, uh, I can be heard, right? Um, thank you, um, panelists. Um, you have uh, hit the nail really well and hard. And uh, what you have uh, said in first uh, response to the first question and the second question are so much, um, we, sh we all share the same issues and the same concerns throughout the Pacific and Palau is no exception. And thank you, Tonga, for uh, talking about the cultural component of our human rights matter, because yeah, yes, we did have it in our societies. Um, i just like to offer some uh, uh, solutions that we have uh, dealt with in, in Palau. And one is uh, last year, September 2018, 
Palawan Women Conference uh, celebrated its silver anniversary, 25 years. They have been dealing with the women issues for 25 years. And these are traditional women organization. And uh, so it, it's uh, kind of uh, interesting to note like what kind of issues they've been dealing with. It ranges from food security to health to education and to women issues in, in, the, in, the, in villages. So that's one of the solutions that we have been dealing with. And yes, uh, uh, Dr. Colin, the database, data collection is crucial if we need to deal with uh, solutions effectively. Um, also, uh, back in 2015, uh, late Senator Catherine Casole, um, she passed away, uh, I think, last year. Uh, she introduced a bill which is now a, a statute, now, a very strong uh, um, Advocate of Family Protection Act. And that has actually, um, there's been a forum uh, working with the police, with the courts. Th so there is some work done on the level of modern day issues that we are dealing with. And as well as um, uh, gender policy uh, has actually been uh, formulated uh, by our gender office. And so some of the solutions that yes, we're dealing with as, as a small nation, and at the same time dealing with our cultural aspect of our our role as men and as women. And it's not easy, but you know, it's one of those things that we have to deal with the traditional aspect as well as modern day aspect of our um, issues. So thank you for, uh, for your uh, contribution. Thank you, Honorable Faustina. Um, we have an additional, and this will be our last um, intervention, and this is from Honorable Pramila Kumar, um, and she is the Minister of Trade um, from Fiji. Thank you. This is generally not my area of work, but definitely it has been very enlightening listening to the stories that you have shared. But I can only share one aspect, which I'm aware of from Fiji. Uh, I've come across cases where if a woman is working for a woman's crisis center or on women's issues, you are perceived very differently. You are seen as women who are breaking homes. This is the perception the man gives, and that needs to go away. And uh, I feel the issues that you are raising is all about ending violence, but not ending relationship. And the relationship must continue. So that's all I wanted to share. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and that concludes our interventions and panel discussions. So please, everyone, if I can invite you to join me by um, thanking our panelists for their wonderful um, being able to share with us their experiences and knowledge, be able to contribute to this course. Um, without further ado, and that ends my duty as well, and I will pass it on to um, Ms. Natalia Canem and also um, the Commissioner of the EU, Nevin Mimitsa, for their reflections and final remarks to conclude the special event. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll be brief because so much has been said. It has been a fantastic panel and learning experience. Thank you very much. And I will just say that the Pacific moves into the spotlight initiative with some decided advantages. The main one is that the agenda is being led by the Pacific in partnership with the EU, UN. And the precision with which we can use this solutions-oriented approach and also the data and monitoring and being able to show qualitatively and quantitatively that the mindset of young people is changing is another decided advantage. So we're very proud to work with you and we look forward to the success of the initiative. Thank you so much. Well, I would really like to thank uh, all of you, especially our panelists for this meaningful and, and, and fruitful discussion. Uh, today we have shown the strengths of our shared determination to eliminate all forms of violence against women and girls. Uh, we have also shown the strengths of the partnership 
partnership approach that is the core of the Spotlight Initiative. So this is, this is a unique model, model of partnership that we are witnessing today. Uh, one which counts on the governments and civil society in the Pacific to come together and not uh, only to make change in the short term, but to challenge mindsets in the long term. That is what we have in front of us to do. Building on uh, our previous efforts to fight domestic violence, we count on you for designing and implementing the spotlight programs in the Pacific together. So that the next generation of boys never associate masculinity and what, uh, what it means to be a man with control and violence. And that the next generation of girls grow up safe and equal with a voice and a choice to realize their full potential. So thank you once again, and let's keep our strengths, our contribution together in order to have a successful uh, Pacific, uh, Pacific approach and Pacific actions on the, on the Spotlight Initiative. Thank you. I'm sorry, everyone, this is not a serious um, issue to discuss. It's a fun one, in, um, actually. I've uh, just been informed that there is a cocktail reception after this. <laughs> so um, <laughs> we can all wind down after. So everyone is invited to it. So thank you very much. And we're just outside. OK, just outside. Enjoy your evening. Yeah.